welcome to the channel. I'm so glad you're here. And I want to thank all the new subscribers, and several of you have asked that I go through our seven-year timeline, Daniel's 70th week. I thought this is a good time to do it because I also have some new revelations, some new details about the timeline that I want to add and make videos, and I just have not had time. So this is a great opportunity for me to do this. So there will be something for everybody, whether you're new or if you've been with us for a while. Now, where I'm at, I don't have um, a special microphone for this laptop. I'm just using a different format to go through the timeline. I'll be recording my screen, which is new for me. I've got some new software to learn, and oh, it's it's been a real learning curve, but it's good for me. Pretty soon I'll have that under my belt, but until then, please excuse my flaws. But I hope you enjoy the video and that you get some new insight, new inspiration into the scriptures out of it, and I'll talk to you later. What you are looking at is our very basic timeline. The pre-trib rapture of the bride is imminent. It really could happen any time. So we like to use this timeline because it has been so successful in training even brand new converts Bible prophecy. It gets them off on the right foot. It gives them enough wiggle room for them to make discoveries on their own. But I'm going to go through this today and add things to the timeline, events and why they're going to happen, God's purpose for them. Our criteria for this timeline was to first find out the three things that God wants. And those are things he wants to have secured for his Sabbath day rest. He is preparing for his seventh day rest, his Sabbath, the 7,000th year, which is Christ's millennial reign. So he's using these 6,000 years of history that mankind has experienced to prepare. Now, the Bible is an agricultural book. And you will notice as you're reading the, in especially the Old Testament, how often crops and vineyards and seasons were mentioned. And this was to teach us that there are three harvests. There's the first fruits harvest, which is the pre-trib rapture of the bride. There is the main harvest, which is the mid-trib rapture of the church. And there are the gleanings, which involves the remnant. So there are three raptures and they coincide with the harvests. Each rapture has a specific use for God. He has many purposes for each rapture, but just to keep this short, we're going to cover the main items that he is wanting to secure. So God has made promises to Abraham, to Jacob, to the church, and to his son. So that is another piece of information of why we have established this timeline, why we use this timeline. It's so easy to use that anytime you're reading any passage of scripture, you can prayerfully figure out where that passage of scripture lands on this timeline prophetically, because there is a prophetic layer of the scriptures. Now, we are expecting the pre-trib rapture of the helpmate bride anytime. God has promised to give his son a possession. Now, a possession will be different than what he has promised his son for an inheritance, but the bride will be his own possession, and she is going to be a helpmate. She will have an eternal body, will live in heaven, and she will minister with Christ as one, working with him to secure the two other things that the Father wants. Now, the best type and shadow of how God is going to select the bride is when you study out Genesis 24. And the best template for the pre-trib rapture of the bride is John 4, 28. And that's the woman at the well. And verse 28 is when she leaves her stone water pot. Now, let me tell you, anytime somebody leaves their stone water pot, that means they have either died or they are going to be raptured. So that's a really good passage to study. And we've done videos in the past on that, and we'll do some more because it's such an important passage of Scripture. So the bride is going to work with Jesus to secure the other two things the Father wants, as I mentioned. Well, the tribulation actually begins when the beast system confirms a covenant with the many. That's Daniel 9, 27. That's when the day counts begin. 
Interestingly, the church will know when their rapture is because the Bible provides them with the day counts. However, they'll have to be awake and alert in order to know the hour. Now, when it comes to the gleanings, their rapture, it's a little bit different than the bride and the church. The bride and the church will get glorified eternal bodies that will live in heaven, and those bodies will enable them to traverse heaven and earth. However, when Jesus was talking about the parable of the wheat and tares, he was talking about this particular rapture. Now, a rapture is any time someone is snatched from harm. But with the wheat, they remain in their mortal bodies and they're taken to the father's barn. And there's going to be a reason why it's the father's barn. Now, the tares are snatched also, but not to safety. They're going to be gathered and burned in the fire. Okay, so when the beast confirms the covenant with the many, that is when the two witnesses will come on the scene and they are going to get into the ruler's face. Now, we don't know how long of a gap is in between the rapture of the bride and this signing of a covenant or a confirming of a covenant. Is it the Abraham Accords? We don't know, but it's something significant and God will make sure that the left behind church will know that point because he gives such specific day counts. Now, those two witnesses that will come prophesying and the 144,000 Jews that are sealed, that is Romans 11, those prophecies coming into play. It's prophesied through Romans 11 that believing Israel will be grafted back into the church. That nation, those believing Jews out of Israel 2,000 years ago, they kicked off the church age and they will close out the church age. For some reason, these prophecies are being ignored by most Bible teachers. However, when we see the 144,000 sealed Jews, that is God fulfilling his promises to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, because God promised Israel that his sons would be ruling and reigning. They will have a grand ministry in the millennial reign. So by God sealing 12,000 from every tribe, that will represent Israel as a whole. 2,000 years ago, there were not enough believing Jews for God to consider that Israel had fulfilled its mandate, and Israel's mandate was to go and spread the good news of the Messiah to all the nations. They didn't do it, so God raised up the Gentiles. We've been doing it for 2,000 years. However, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, meaning God is going to require Israel to fulfill that mandate. So once the bride is removed, the believing Jews are going to be grafted back into the church, they will wake up the sleepy church, and together they will fulfill the Great Commission. They will bring in the Great White Harvest. It will be global, a global harvest. More souls will come into the kingdom of God for those first three and a half years than ever before in the 2,000-year church history. So that three and a half years of the first tribulation is going to be full of activity. Now, one of the other things that's going to be going on is unbelieving Israel, who won't believe in their Messiah, they're not going to be grafted into the church, they are going to be oppressing the church on a global scale. Now, persecution has been going on regionally for the last 2,000 years. This is nothing new. But once believing Israel is grafted back into the church, it's going to be a global persecution, especially towards the Jews, because the beast system does not want believing Israel to be glorified. So the two witnesses and the 144,000 Jews, they're going to be persecuted this entire time of the three and a half years, just like the Apostle Paul was. And he was mainly persecuted by his own countrymen. Everywhere he went, 
His countrymen were oppressing him, harming him, beating him, imprisoning him, and he had a very difficult ministry. So too will the 144,000 Jews that are grafted in. So too will those two witnesses that are prophesying to their leaders in Israel. Now, in that first three and a half years of the tribulation, there is, as I said, there's going to be global persecution. There will be global martyrdom. The Christians will pay a heavy price for coming to believe in Jesus as their Messiah. The Gentile Christians will be paying a very heavy price. Once again, just like the early church, they were martyred so too will be the church here at the end of the church age. Many will be martyred. However, many will make it to this mid-trib rapture. The Father wants a significant amount of saints to be raptured. There's a definite purpose for that. Now, I want to start talking about the differences between the bride and the church because it's becoming a real stumbling block for Christians because they have continued to believe that the bride and the church are one group. In a sense, they are because the bride is in the body of Christ. The bride is still a part of the church. It's just that we need to think of the bride as the rib of Christ. And just like Jesus has a resurrected body in heaven, he has a body on earth. At the pre-trib rapture of the bride, Jesus will still have a resurrected body in heaven, and he will still have his body on earth because they still have work to do. Now, the differences between the bride and the church are God uses different terms that many people have not picked up. If they're not using this timeline, they are not going to pick up on the other terms God uses for the bride and the other terms that God uses for the church. For instance, the bride is referred to as the hidden manna, also as the rainbow around the throne. She is the coat of many colors that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And incidentally, it's because of that coat that made his brothers jealous. The bride speaks of intimacy. Jesus told us the difference between Mary and Martha. So the bride is more like the Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, enjoying and eating on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, it's not that God loves the church any less. It's just that they are a little bit busier. They are the Marthas. But other terms that God uses for the church, and again, if you're not using this timeline, you're never going to pick up on these other terms. But the other terms that God uses for the church are children of the bride chamber, the man-child in Revelation 12, 5, the rod of iron that is raptured up, the city set on a hill that cannot be hidden because everything about the bride is hidden. Uh, The church is referred to as the new Jerusalem. And so think of the church as God's righteous government And they are going to replace the wicked government in the heavenlies, the Ephesians 6.12 crowd, those rulers, powers, principalities in the heavenly places that are oppressing all of mankind. So God is going to utilize the glorified, raptured church. Once they're raptured, they go up and they yank those principalities out of their seats And the church sits down to begin ruling and reigning as the rod of iron with Christ. Now, it's not that Michael and his angels couldn't kick them out. It's not that they didn't have enough power. It's that the righteous angels did not have the authority. See, there is an authority that God will give to resurrected and raptured saints that Michael and his angels don't have. A resurrected, raptured saint is made a little bit higher than the angels, higher than every principality, every wicked principality, and even every righteous principality. So once the church is raptured and they're in their glorified body and sitting on those thrones, they have the authority to throw the red dragon and all of his wicked angels 
down to earth. And that's when, for the first time, you see the dragon being called the Great Dragon. And that's why that last three and a half years of the tribulation is called the Great Tribulation. Because can you imagine what it's going to be like on earth when the dragon and all of his wicked hosts are on the earth? It's going to be absolutely horrible for the Jewish and Gentile remnant, but especially for the Jewish remnant. Anybody who misses this mid-trib rapture, they are considered remnant. And like I said, there's going to be Jewish and Gentile. And the beast system, when they break that covenant and Israel's Arab neighbors come flooding into Israel, that's when a lot of activities happen. That mid-trib point is the most well-documented period in the book of Revelation. We get a lot of data day counts, just a lot of information. And again, we've made a video on that as well. Now, this is why once that beast is on the earth, the, the serpent and all of those angels, like I said, once they are on the earth, that last three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation and also the time of Jacob's trouble. Many people call the entire seven years as the time of Jacob's trouble, but that's not exactly accurate because you see over here in the first half, unbelieving Israel is actually a part of the beast system. Their unbelieving Israel is growing proud. They're growing stronger and stronger. I don't know if you've noticed, but the nation of Israel is number one in global surveillance. They have a lot of technology and now Arab nations are joining in ventures through the Abraham Accords. So this first half of tribulation, Israel is just growing stronger and stronger and more and more full of self-pride. But once the beast breaks covenant, Israel's Arab neighbors flood Jerusalem, that's when unbelieving Israel recognizes they are in trouble and they flee and many are going to be killed. To the same extent that the beast system is persecuting this remnant of Jews and Gentiles, the righteous government in the heavenlies, the church, is going to be helping to preserve the remnant because God has a glorious outcome for remnant. Now, out of this remnant, believing Jews and Gentiles, there's going to be two groups that come out of this remnant. They're either going to be the wheat or the tares. They're either going to receive Christ as their Savior, or they're going to continue denying him. At the end of the age, that Jesus spoke about the wheat and the tares. This is where the tares are going to be snatched, gathered, and burned in the fire. But the wheat they're going to be raptured, yet they do not go up in the atmosphere. They remain in their mortal bodies. They would need a glorified body to go up to heaven, and they don't get that. And there's a reason why. The wheat goes into the Father's barn. They are going to eventually replace the current earthly wicked rulers. And God is going to do that by keeping them safe in his barn during Christ's second advent to earth when he is destroying the red dragon and all of his angels. The tares will be snatched. And now who are the tares? They would be augmented humans. They would be augmented with AI. They're going to be clones, human clones. Those are tares. Uh, Nephilim would be tares because they are part human, part angel. So all those tears are going to be done away with. So now we have to ask, well, who will God destroy when he comes back with all of his hosts if all the tears are gone? Well, he's going to destroy all of the 100% wicked angels and all those angels that have come up from the pit because the earth is going to be full of them. So that's who God and his heavenly hosts are going to destroy when they come back for Christ's second advent. And while the wheat is being kept safely in the barn. Now, after 
God has cleaned up all those wicked angels. God is going to take wheat out of the barn. And you have to ask yourself, why does God say barn? Why does he use a barn? Well, what is a barn for? A barn is for grain. And grain is seed. Well, the remnant are going to reseed the earth during Christ's millennial reign. That means they're going to repopulate the earth with humans. This is why God wants to preserve their flesh. It's during this period, towards the end of the tribulation, that God is now going to take action to preserve flesh. After the pre-trib rapture of the bride, there's still plenty of flesh on earth. After the mid-trib rapture of the church, there's still plenty of flesh. But as it gets towards the end of the seven-year great tribulation, when the beast has all technology at his fingertips, everything is being surveilled, everybody is uh, suffering, that is where the potential for all flesh to be destroyed is at its highest. And God wants to preserve flesh because the earth was created for man. So God will repopulate the earth with grain, seed that is in the barn. And this way, Jesus will have humans to rule and reign over millennial reign on earth. That seventh day, our Father's rest. Okay, so that, I'm hoping that is kind of making sense to you why God uses specific terms in the scriptures, and it's for a purpose. We just need to ask him and prayerfully seek his answers to understand why he's leaving the remnant in their natural bodies, and they remain in this atmosphere on this earth. Now, I don't know exactly where they're going to go. I'm speculating on a few things, but your prophecy team here isn't quite certain enough to make any statements about that. Now, there's something I want to talk to you about that happens just a little ways after mid-trib in heaven. And this is what everybody is interested in. And that is when the bride and Jesus actually get married. Well, we need to kind of take the focus off the bride because that's really more about our King's Day, Jesus Christ. His wedding day is his coronation. He is going to be the focus of that day. Jesus is going to be officially crowned king on his wedding day. And this is why his coronation is going to take place just a little ways after this mid-trib rapture. And after all the martyrs are brought into the kingdom, they've died, their spirits have entered heaven. Every citizen in the kingdom of God has a glorified eternal body will be present at that grand event. The Father wants to honor His Son and have every heavenly citizen, the righteous angels, the bride, the church, the martyrs that are resting underneath the altar, they're going to be brought out. Everybody who's a citizen in the heavenly kingdom of God will be at that event. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the terms God uses for the church are the children of the bride chamber. And so this rapture is when they are actually born. Revelation 12, 5 tells us that the woman gives birth to the man-child. Well, that is a global event. The entire church in every country is going to be raptured on that day. It's just that the book of Revelation is Israel centric. It's Jewish centric. It's God letting us know what's going to happen in Israel and how he is working to preserve them and fulfill his prophecies and his promises to Abraham. Because he promised to Abraham that his seed would be as the stars of heaven. So that re represents the heavenly government and as the sand on the seashore. So that represents the earth. So the mid-trib rapture is God fulfilling part of his promises to Abraham. Bringing in the remnant is God fulfilling the rest of that promise to Abraham about the, his seed being like the sand on the seashore, earthly. Now, getting back to Christ's coronation and the children of the bride chamber. 
The same way that Mary and Joseph were betrothed and Mary gave birth to her son before she was married to Joseph. They had not yet had a wedding ceremony. We know this from Matthew chapter 1, that we're given the detail that Joseph kept Mary a virgin. Well, that's an important piece of information because that tells us that they had not gotten married yet because marriage is consummated by being in the bridal chamber. Well, Mary had given birth to Jesus before her wedding ceremony. So too, Israel is going to give birth to all of her children before the marriage ceremony, before the coronation of our king. So God is following the type and shadow of Mary and when she gave birth. So I hope that little detail helps. Thank you so much for listening to our video, and I hope to talk to you later. Bye!